to be effectively an online stripper. I mean, that's what you do, right? Yeah. Way worse than an online stripper. But, um, what do you mean, way worse? <laughs> way worse. Online strippers just, you know, naked. I do things that are way more grotesque well, than that. Just pornography? Pornography, anything. But it's all within what I want to do, and I absolutely love it, and I'm really good at it. Yeah, well, joining me now is OnlyFans creator L. Broke. I Hi. did ask you and then got it wrong, didn't I? Yeah. And the host of the Blair White Project, Blair White, over in uh, the States. So welcome to both of you. All right, L. Now, tell me about yourself. Yeah. What were you before you did this? Um, I was a law student, um, and now I'm a TikTok. A university? Coach. Yeah, university, Uni of Southampton. So. Did you graduate have... or? No, no, no. I dropped out to do OnlyFans because I was making a lot of money. So I was like, why am I doing so you're reading? Studying, studying to be a, law a lawyer. Yes. And then you start doing OnlyFans while you're at university. Yes. What made you get into it? Because I saw how much money other people were earning, and I was thinking, hey, I can do this too. And then it turns out I'm pretty good at getting my clothes off, and I was like, this is a career for me. Now, see, OK, look, I've nothing against you. I don't, I'm not taking a moral view here, right? You can do what the hell you like if it's legal. Uh, I'm just disappointed that someone like you, who's obviously got a great brain, yeah. training to be a law student at university, decides to pack it all in to just take your clothes off for, for perfect strangers on OnlyFans. Why? Because I wouldn't have made loads of money as a solicitor anyway. Like, I would have earned money, yes, but I earned that in two weeks now. And I earned that throughout... How much do you make? I mean, how much money do you make? I earn a lot. How much do you make? Maybe, like, double that? <laughs> well, I, I, we won't get into what I earn, but what do you earn? I, I earn a lot of money. Well, like, give me I, a number. Well, I don't want to give a specific number, but... Why not? I, I'm 0 0.01 on OnlyFans, so I'm as top as it gets. What does that mean? It means you are the best of the best. 0.01% of... Best of the best of what? Any fans creators in monetary terms. Why are you so good? Because I'm really good looking. Right. And original. We're certainly you not shy, get... are you? No, I know I'm good at what I do. I'm not going to harangue I... you for being cocky, because that would be ridiculous coming from me, but what do your family think of this? I mean, they must be incredibly disappointed, surely, that you backed in a potentially really successful career as a lawyer to yeah. do this. Yes, my dad is dead and my mum is on my payroll. My family are Your mum's on your payroll? My mum is on my payroll. In what? She doing what? Um, admin. What does that mean? It's just behind the scenes work. She doesn't do anything rude or anything. So she loves you doing this? It, well, she doesn't praise it at the pub like, woohoo, my daughter does OnlyFans, but she's supportive. She knows that I'm over 18, I can do what the hell I want. And she knows that, you know, her views can't, like, in packed my life. What is she going to do? You're grounded because you do OnlyFans. Like, what the hell? It's 2023. People can do what the hell they want. No, no, don't get me wrong. I totally subscribe to that. And we, we the show... Oh, you subscribe? Uh, I don't subscribe <laughs> to you, but uh, <laughs> um, I haven't bestowed you that honour yet. No, but the look, I, I think this show's called Uncensored. You can do what the hell you like, right? I don't care. But I, I'm just curious about you being someone who embarked on a, a law career, mm. was obviously very bright, went to university, packed it in just for money to be effectively an online stripper. I mean, that's what you do, right? Yeah, way worse than an online stripper. But, um, what do you mean, way worse? <laughs> way worse. Online strippers just, you know, naked. I do things that are way more grotesque well, than just that. pornography? Pornography, anything. But it's all within what I want to do, and I absolutely love it, and I'm really good at it. You know, I could be a good lawyer, yes, but also am I good at doing other things on video and camera? How would yes. you feel when you want to have kids yourself? Well, I mean, that's... I, I don't really want kids right now. But, but you will do. How old are you? 25. Right, so you will do at some stage, probably, right? Maybe. When you do, are you going to be proud that you have your little ones and they look at you and go, didn't you want to be a lawyer, Mummy? What happened? Yeah. And you go, yeah, but look at all my stuff. They can cry in a Ferrari. Well, we all know about stepping down from jobs we love at ITV, but there are big questions left to answer over this scandal. Or is it time to say enough is enough. Joining me to discuss all this is journalist and author Jenny Kleeman, Talk TV's Richard Tice, and Rosanna Lockwood, my, my stand in. <laughs> <laughs> but not for long. Like all stand in, she's plotting and planning to seize the big chair. Um, all right. No comment. Um, <laughs> well, if you're not, you should be. Um, Rosanna, mm. what's your take on all this? I mean, like, I've been off for a week, reading about it, obviously, while lying on a sunbed. And it just reached a crescendo after Schofield gave these interviews. Where I looked at, I've known him a long time, 35 years. I wrote a biography of Philip Schofield, literally, in the 90s. Um, and I looked at the guy and I thought, you are completely broken. Yeah. I uh, and, yeah. and when someone is in that condition, um, even though I felt that his comparison to Caroline Flack was clumsy and, 
and he probably shouldn't have said that. He probably meant it. He probably did feel that he was genuinely, what's left? I may as well kill myself. What do you think of the whole thing? Where are we now with this story? I mean, the question that you lined us up with was, should we still care about it? Is it too far now? I'd say it was too far a week ago. I was saying this when I sat in your chair this time last week. Why? Why do the public care about this? I don't really give two hoots about it. It's a television show. Perhaps a bit reductive. I know it's representative of other issues in society. I know people are interested, but sometimes what's in the interest of the public isn't what's in the public interest. Richard. Uh, for me, Piers, actually, he probably was right to give that interview because it highlighted to everybody just how he was feeling. And I think that was the moment at which actually people stopped attacking him and focused on what I, I think is the right thing to focus on, which is the appalling, incompetent leadership mm. and management of ITV, which is actually a seriously important company well, look, the and one brand thing, within the UK. The one thing I know for sure, a lot of people at ITV knew about the rumours about this relationship. I mean, everybody knew at ITV, right? Let's be crystal clear. That building was a buzz with this for about three years, because three years ago, the National TV Awards in the ITV box, the young man concerned in this story uh, confessed his undying love for Philip Schofield. Everybody knew that. In which so this idea that the whole management are basically going, we didn't know anything, come on. There we um, are. That, so that, that, that proves my point. That I, mean, I know is not true. I mean, she has presided over an absolutely catastrophic performance of this company. The shares are down 60%, the dividends down 40%. She's being summoned to the select committee. Mm. And yet the non-exec directors, they're saying nothing. The company has said nothing at the corporate level and, you know, about this. And Dame Carolyn, uh, God bless her, she was the CEO when I left Good Morning Britain. And they put me in a position where I had to either apologise for disbelieving Princess Pinocchio or I had to leave immediately. There was no inquiry for me. It was just like, <laughs> you either now publicly apologise for disbelieving Meghan Markle's lies, as it turned out, or you have to leave immediately. So I took the leaving immediately option. Uh, but what's fascinating is two days after that, after I'd left, uh, the Telegraph newspaper runs a story that says that Meghan Markle had written to Dame Carolyn on the Monday night before I left on the Tuesday, demanding my head on a plate. Nobody's thought to mention that to me. And had they had done, I wouldn't have been so hasty in leaving. I would have said, I'm not leaving because some princess tells you to make me leave, right? So now, to bring it up to full speed now, the same Dame Carolyn McCall has repeatedly said in public that it had no bearing on the decision to force me out. That is a lie. If you're watching Dame Carolyn, that's a lie. You know it's a lie. I know it's a lie. I don't want an ongoing fight with ITV. I had a great time at ITV. Although I didn't even get a carriage clock when I left. Not even a carriage but, clock. But, but if it, on, 15 years, not even a clock. Yeah, but what would you I do, mean, what would you do with you, a clock? Even if you on. work in a factory, somebody <laughs> gives you a clock, right? I didn't even get a thank you. Right? At least Philip Schofield got 30 seconds of Derma O'Leary on the Monday thanking him. I got nothing. I trebled the ratings, not even a garage club. It seems, it seems so, the management and leadership... But, but on a serious point, here's my... Well, it's a, it's a serious point. My point really is, my experience of ITV management from the top down is that when it suits them, they'll lie through their back teeth. Secondly, that uh, the way they handle talent is morally schizophrenic. Depending who you are and how important they think you are to the firmament at any given moment, or how important your agency is, in the case of Philip Schofield, Ant and Deck, and so on, people like that, Holly Willoughby, um, they look at all those things, they make moral judgments based on that kind of stuff. That's where they lose me. It's not consistent. Quite clearly, a woman can have a penis. I mean, that happened before I went away, and I spent the whole week I was in France mulling over that answer and concluded it was a completely stupid thing to say. Wasn't it? Can you imagine if I'd said 10 years ago that British politics would pivot on the question of whether women have penises? Or that the most terrifying question in the world would be, what is a woman? A documentary of that name, What is a Woman, calmly eviscerates this absurdity by allowing the people who advance the looniest arguments to tie themselves in their own knots. Please, if one person could tell me what a woman is. You are not here for women! We ask you to leave! What is that? A woman is not anything in particular. There is not one particular thing. It could be many things to many people. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is?
Do you want to tell us what a woman is? I'm a biological woman that medically transitioned to appear like a male. I will never be a man. The interview's over. Let's turn off the cameras. Excuse me. Well, they're fair. I just wanted to know what is a woman. And you're not going to find out. Well, that documentary was posted to Twitter at the end of last week, so it can be seen far and wide for free to mark its anniversary. But in a sign of these fevered times, it was censored for the crime of misgendering. Misgendering. Well, Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, personally intervened and then recommended the film to his gazillions of followers. And in a second sign of our times, the tweet promoting the film has now been viewed 172 million times. So the biggest film in the world right now isn't Little Mermaid, Spider-Man, or that is Fast and Furious. It's What is a Woman by Matt Walsh, which I think shows the level of sheer exasperation there is of this relentless campaign to subvert reality and bully anybody who refuses to go along with it. For the avoidance of doubt, a woman is an adult human female. That's it. Beginning and end. The percentage of women with penises is zero. Well, the Daily Maguire's uh, Matt Walsh, the filmmaker of the year right now, uh, joins me. Matt, well, congratulations on having the biggest movie in the world. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a staggering week for you. I mean, this it was a great film when I watched it originally because uh, it just basically kept asking the same question I've been asking on the show for the last year. Uh, but it's a question which flummoxes everyone from Supreme Court justices to male politicians here to anyone you care to think of in public life. Um, when you put it on Twitter and then it got suppressed and then Elon Musk intervened, what was your feeling about that whole process? Well, when they first when they first decided to censor it, it was kind of this feeling of, oh, well, well, here we go again, because this is what we're used to from uh, from big tech. It's, you know, you know, every single big tech platform is run by the radical far left. And especially on this particular issue, um, they, they they don't want you to talk about it. They don't want it acknowledged. There are basic truths that aren't allowed to be discussed. We were just demonetized by YouTube uh, on misgendering grounds. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, we thought that Twitter would be different under Elon Musk, and then they kind of pulled the rug out up from under us. And, and at first, for me, it was sort of this: okay, well, I guess Twitter is the same as all the rest of them and, until Elon Musk, uh, as you say, intervened. And uh, next thing you know, where there are resignations and all these sort of things happening happening over at Twitter in their uh, in their brand safety department, um, which which makes it clear that uh, that no, in fact, Twitter is the one exception. It's the one major big tech platform where free speech is allowed. So I was I was happy that of course how how it worked out, but also that this film, on top of dealing with the um, with the gender issue, also could uh, you know succeed in um, really a victory for free speech. I think it's a really important victory for free speech because if if it had gone the other way and yeah. Twitter had decided to keep this film censored, then that would set a uh, really dangerous precedent, I think, for uh, all the other platforms. Yeah, no, no question. Elon Musk said this in reply to someone who tweeted him. This was a mistake by many people at Twitter, talking about the suppression of your film. It's definitely allowed. Whether or not you agree with using someone's preferred pronouns, not doing so is at most rude and certainly breaks no laws. I should know that I do personally use someone's preferred pronouns, just as I use someone's preferred name, simply from a standpoint of good manners. However, for the same reason I object to rude behaviour, ostracism or threats of violence, if the wrong pronoun or name is used, which I think is a pretty reasonable position. I mean, is that a position you would share? No, I mean, I don't personally share that position. I'm not going to use preferred pronouns. I'm going to use the pronouns that are that are accurate. You know, I, I just reject the concept of preferred pronouns. Uh, you, you, don't, you can prefer whatever pronoun you want or whatever adverb or you know, noun you want, but that doesn't mean that I have to use it. You don't get to put words in my mouth. However, uh, the, the position that Elon Musk has on this is uh, you know, it's a position a lot of people have, and at the very least, it respects free speech. So this is what he's going to do, but you can say what you want because you, you can't force someone else to share your perceptions. That's what the preferred pronoun thing is all about. Yeah. You know, they're trying to not only put words in your mouth, they want you to affirm their perception of reality. And uh, the idea that we would be forced to do that, either legally or even according to the um, terms of service of a big tech platform, is just, uh, it's just insane. Well, it is. And, of course, the argument they use is what's offensive. But, of course, the whole point of free speech, really, at its heart, is that you should be allowed to offend people. I mean, that's the point of free speech. It's not that everyone agrees with each other. It's that you should be able to v 
be vehemently disagree or be offensive or rude, if you want, and people should be able to tolerate that because that's what happens in a free society with a thriving democracy that believes in free speech. Yeah, I, and, and that is the importance of free, free speech. And like I said, a lot of this story is, is about a victory for free speech, which is really important. But I also want to note that, you know, what's happening here is on, is on an even deeper level because um, on the left, what they're trying to shut down, it isn't just speech generally, and they are trying to shut down speech, but they're trying to shut down true speech. Mm. So it's not just speech. It's, it's in particular basic fundamental truths of life that they're trying to right. stop us from saying. And, and that makes it all the more uh, dangerous and egregious. I mean, your issue with YouTube was they demonetized you effectively by saying that you had misgendered Dylan Mulvaney, who's this transgender influencer that, of course, has created Bud Light's uh, revenue by taking part in a, in a PR stunt for them, which enraged the, the core yeah. customers at Bud Light. Um, what did that whole thing tell you? I mean, A, what happened to you guys in terms of, of the way YouTube responded, but also about what happened to Bud Light? Yeah, I think it shows that people are, as far as Bud Light goes, people are uh, exhausted by this. Uh, the left, you know, they were able to run roughshod over the culture in, in Western culture generally for years. And I guess they assumed that there would never be any, that there would be, never be any pushback, and they kept going and kept going until normal people just finally had enough of it. And you know, I wish we had enough of it much sooner, but, uh, but, it, but at least now, finally, that's, uh, the, you know, a, a line is being drawn. And I think one of those lines is when you're trying to get people again, trying to force them to aff affirm and celebrate something that's just not true. Uh, at a certain point, I think it's, uh, it's just it's too far for the average person. That's what we're seeing now. This is not, despite what the left says, you know, this pushback against uh, LGBT pride and against the transing of kids, this is not some sinister right-wing, well-funded uh, conspiracy. This is really a, this is a groundswell thing. This is uh, this is grassroots. These are just normal people who've had enough of it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And in Dylan Mulvaney's case, I mean, Dylan Mulvaney identified as a gay man until last year. And a lot of women have been genuinely outraged that Dylan Mulvaney has been putting out these videos, effectively mocking women, actually, if you look at them. And that's been my problem with what Dylan Mulvaney has done. So Dylan Mulvaney can, can call herself whatever she wants. I don't care. Um, what she can't do, I don't think, is make millions of dollars mocking the concept of womanhood um, when, until last year, she identified as a, as a gay man and is clearly a biological male. And it's also the irony that we hear so much about the dangers of appropriation these days, uh, even when it comes to things like Halloween costumes, where someone is clearly just having fun and they put on a Native American Halloween costume, whatever it may be. We're told that that's, uh, that's horrifically racist and it's, it's uh, demonizing and it's a caricature mm. of the person you're Ridiculous. wearing the costume of. Well, well that's, that's exactly what Dylan Mulvaney is doing. He's, he's, uh, mm. he's making a caricature of womanhood. This uh, cover of Glamour magazine involving uh, Logan Brown, who is a trans man, appearing to be a pregnant man on the cover. But, of course, Logan Brown is a biological female. Uh, so it's actually a pregnant female that we're looking at on the cover. When a, a, a magazine, a mass market, mass selling women's magazine like Glamour does that to celebrate Pride Month, what does that say about where we've come to as a society? Well, I, I tell you one thing it actually says is it, it makes the, it, the opposite of the point they're trying to make because the point it actually makes is that women are still women no matter how they identify. I mean, I read that article and they're making a big deal about, you know, Logan Brown was saying, well, Yes, uh, I, I exist. I'm I'm pregnant. This is this is real. I know it's blowing people's minds. Well, no, it doesn't blow anyone's mind. We we know that you're a woman. Even, even if you cut your hair short and you give yourself a different name, you're still a woman. You still have the biological function and capacity of a woman. So that's actually what it proves is that is that these biolog this, this biological identity is inherent. It's immutable. Um, you can't get rid of it. You, you just are who you are, no matter how you identify. No, that's not the point that we're trying to make. But to me, that's that's uh, that's what it proves that even a quote unquote trans man can still get pregnant. Proves that you know she's a woman. We've seen, as I said, Bud Light. We've seen the revenue collapsing after the Dylan Mulvaney thing. We've seen Target, a big supermarket chain in America, suffering similar problems after really going very hard on pride 
merchandise in the children's departments. Uh, we've seen your film try to be cancelled and then bouncing back within days to become the most watched film in the world. I'm getting a gut feeling, Matt, that the, the woke worm is turning, that common sense is beginning to win the day. And it's because the majority of people who've been silent and been cowed into silence are beginning to find their collective voices and acting. 